Hi, Leo. All right. All right. Everybody ready to go? It's 513. Sorry for the delay. All right, so uh, today is, re is respiratory emergencies. We'll start with pediatric and then get into uh, more adult things later on. And um, if you wanna follow along with this PowerPoint, it's up in the Canvas site. So you can go jump on that. If you've got a Mac, you can put on Keynote and you've got a dynamic background shifting around with you the whole time. So, so when I get bored, when I get boring, and you can just look at that and, and stay entertained throughout this lecture. Um, some things to keep in mind with, uh, with respiratory and with pediatric. First with respiratory is this whole mnemonic here, the PACE mnemonic, which is, um, we use it typically for a chest pain call, but this helps us with pulmonary as well. So cardiorespiratorily, this is important to know how the heart and lungs are linked together because uh, there are some cardiac conditions that will cause issues with the lungs, specifically pulmonary edema. The lungs will fill up and it has nothing to do with the lungs being damaged. It has everything to do with the heart being damaged. Typically it's something like CHF or um, something of that nature. So we can use this and we will, I'll show you where this all fits in our patient assessment as we go through this. So keep in mind, even though we may be called to a respiratory emergency, our chief concern, the, the CC that we may be diagnosing or at least treating would be the underlying cardiac condition. So we need to find out exactly what our patients are feeling, how long this has been going on, um, if there's any chest pain associated with it, et cetera, et cetera. So. <clears throat> And then the second thing is with pediatric calls, it, there are a lot of these little viruses, croup, epiglottitis, bronchiolitis, all of these different illnesses that have similar signs and symptoms. In fact, all of them have similar signs and symptoms. And our job is to figure out the difference between each one. And I would say pay particular attention to the the severity of the signs and symptoms, how bad their throat hurts, as well as the rapidity that the symptoms arise, how quickly they show up. And typically the case is obviously the more severe the signs and symptoms or the pain, uh, the more severe the shortest of breath and the, and the faster the signs and symptoms show up. And I mean, in a matter of hours, two to three hours, they're in extremis. Those are usually your more severe respiratory calls. So we'll go through each one of these and kind of try and find your, your similarities and differences. And that, that will really help you when you are doing uh, chest thoracic emergencies, when you have things like narrowing pulse pressures, shortness of breath, JVD. Well, which one is it? Is it a pneumothorax or is it a, is it a, a, a pericardial tamponade? Or is this some kind of pulmonary contusion? Like what the heck are we dealing with? It really comes down to knowing your signs and symptoms for each one, but then knowing the differences with each one and like looking at, well, this comes with JVD and unilateral chest diminished sounds and chest pain. This one doesn't have breathing associated with it or difficulty breathing associated. So it's, it's really you getting your bearing on like the, uh, what they call those little circles, those things that, you know, where the things exist similar to one another and then where they don't. A Venn diagram, thank you, yeah. So it's like, you'll see that Venn, you get five extra credit points today. Boom, thank you. Uh, that's how we're doing it all night. Guys, you got it, you get five. Okay, so that's what I would say, pay particular attention to what's different, what's the same, and you'll probably be okay. And really it comes down to things like, is it a virus or is it a bacteria? Um, does it come on fast or slow? And, and it's a big deal. We're gonna start with pediatric because there's some new ones out there that you should, you know, unusual illnesses that you may not have heard of or you have heard of them and you don't really know what they are. So we'll talk about those. 
Um, and, and then we'll get into the common ones with uh, most adults and elderly uh, respiratory emergencies. So remember, where does this occur? When are we getting our signs and symptoms, diagnosing our patients and doing all of this work? This happens after the scene size up. That's not an issue anymore. Now we're in the primary assessment. And really this is part of AVPU. If you're walking up, you're looking at our patient's positioning, their color, and then shortly thereafter, when you walk up and say, hi, I'm Ken, I'm an EMT. What's your name? What's going on? you're going to be able to ascertain their ability to speak, meaning are they able to give you full word sentences or are they just shaking their head no and all the in-betweens there. And then do you see expiratory uh, pain? Do you see any accessory muscle use? Do you hear expiratory wheezes or inspiratory wheezes as you walk up? Or do you have to listen to hear them? All of those things are occurring in this situation. So basically we've gotten our scene size up established. Um, and by the way, if something happens on these calls, can you go back to scene size up and go, whoa, I didn't realize that I have to go and rechange that scene size up like additional resources or something, right? You just go back and just fix it. But this is supposed to be an order of priority. It doesn't mean that you're going to know everything all the way through. Like I said, you might start a medical call and then realize, oh, this patient's got bruising all over their body when you did this strip and flip. Now it's become a trauma. Now we hold C-spine. It is what it is. You can't change that. You know, no one's going to sue you. If you didn't know and it was obvious it was a baseball bat and blood on the ground and you're throwing them around, then yeah, you should have known it's a trauma. But if you don't know, you don't. As soon as you see it, you correct it. You go back to the, either the scene size up or wherever you need to and go again and push forward. Because, you know, you're in it together. So we've done that. We've apparently done AVPU. We're at ANO times four and we're checking A, B, and C. And really color falls into C, circulatory conditions, right? And airway and breathing, they're happening right there. So based on those, we're going to then break into our secondary. And this is where we start to break into either a sample history and a head to toe or both at the same time to figure out what the respiratory conditions are. Remember, when you hear respiratory on the call in the ambulance, when they say, this is a shortness of breath. This is a respiratory distress call. All of this stuff. For sure, get your mask on. I'm sure everybody knows that now. Mask and goggles and get your stethoscope out. You better get stethoscope lung sounds on all of these patients. I, my paramedic preceptor would murder me. You know, I'd go in and I'd start doing work and he'd go, hang on. What the hell are you doing? And it, you know, I'm in front of the patient. I'm like, what? What? And he's like, are you gonna get lung sounds or what? You know? Oh, oh okay. All right. So, um, without feeling like that, um, remember, you need to get lung sounds on all these people, even if it's nothing serious. You should be able to listen to different things because your goal in this ride along class is to get your rails, bronchi, and wheezes, so that you know what it sounds like and you can now determine them. So. Get lung sounds on everybody. And these are the spots. We've talked about it already. There's a heck of a lot on the back. Usually we just go top, top, middle, middle, base, and base. Don't go below the rib cage. There's no lung sounds below the rib cage. That diaphragm is separating the thoracic cavity from the abdomen. On the front, top, top, and then usually side and side or top, top, mid clavicular. Here's a clavicle, here's a clavicle. Midway down there, you're listening to the tops of the lungs and then somewhere below the nipples or breast, listen here. A lot easier, as I've always said, go mid-axillary. There's a lot less muscle and fat in that area and you can hear more directly in. And if you had your druthers, go with the back, not the front. The back gives you so much better, clearer lung sounds. It's, it's great. Remove clothing, you know, take off sweatshirts and things or at least go under and listen to it. And we're listening for wheezing, ronchi, wheezing. <laughs> now that's coming from my throat, but that's what it sounds like in here. That's actually strider, which we'll talk about later. But that's wheezing. It's whistling through the bronchial tree. That's all it is. It's only in a microscopic level. Ronchi is that big gurgly sputum thick mucus sound. 
Usually, Ronkai comes from the rails, the crackles, the fluid that is initially sat in the lungs has been involved in fighting whatever virus or bacterial infection you have. And that thin fluid, it's like cytoplasm has sat and it's congealed and it's got dead organisms in it and it gets thick and green and gnarly. But when it's new, it sounds like rails or crackles. And when we get into pulmonary edema, that is what we're talking about exactly. It's, um, it's, it's fluid that's coming in either from the pulmonary system or from damaged lungs. And it's just flooding the lung full of fluid. That's what you're hearing with rails and ronchi. And then of course, do you hear lung sounds equally on all sides, on all fields? Do you hear it clear, equal, bilaterally? That's how you'd say it. Clear, equal, bilateral lung sounds. If you don't, well then what's going on? Distant or absent sounds means something serious. Keep in mind that when you're dealing with child and adult airways they're a little bit they're a little bit different Let's see if i can get this dude to listen to me hi hi all right nope he's out all right take a snooze so what are the big differences well primarily the epiglottis and the oral pharynx are a lot larger in a child notice the tongue and the epiglottis in a child, because these don't grow very much throughout your life, you kind of grow into them. That you kind of they grow proportionally around those two structures, and all that means is that they're bigger. And if there's anything going on in the airway that involves the tongue or the epiglottis, it's going to be much more serious in a kid because it can lodge inside different areas, and you can literally stop people from breathing. Your epiglottis, which covers the larynx. It's locked down. You ain't breathing. You're done. So very serious condition. We take epiglottitis incredibly serious, which is that yellow one that you can't read. <laughs> so first and foremost, croup. I I'm sure you've all heard of croup or have heard of that. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, good. All right. Well, croup is uh, also called a seal bark. <laughs> They say the seal bark when they have it. Not to be confused with the um, with pertussis, which is also similar. Can you tell one from the other? Some people can. Some patients you can definitely tell. Some you can't. If that's the case, err on the side of the more serious uh, respiratory condition. Croup, however, is a viral infection most of the time. Most always a viral infection, and that should be a good indicator to you. Um, that it's not as serious. Most of the time, well, I can't say that either, but it, it usually, if you see somebody uh, seal barking things, oftentimes it's croup, it's, it's a viral infection. So what do you have? Well, it infects the upper respiratory, this whole area up through here. Uh, this is the kid that wakes up in the middle of the night, coughing, coughing, and then suddenly it starts going, ah, ah. you can just tell it's just raw and red back there. Usually kids between six months to three years, and it takes a little bit longer. It takes a few, like a day or so to really get significantly bad. But as with most viruses, you're gonna get chills. You're gonna have febrile patients. They will sweat. They may not be able to eat. They have a sore throat. But along with that, because the upper respiratory tract, this area here, is inflamed, well, you've narrowed that passage. And so strider and that seal bark are very common. Strider, you'll hear like a little bit of wheezing. I have a good lung sounds for you to hear that today. So that'll be good. So, and this is due to, as I said, an upper respiratory swelling. So it narrows the passages in the, in the larynx. Epiglottitis is a much more severe infection. This primarily uh, affects the epiglottis. What was that? Yeah, it says epiglottitis. I'll change it. Sorry. It looks so much better with the, uh, with the keynote because it was like, uh, well, that's funny. Um, because it was, war it was, you know, it was all moving and fancy and everything. All right. You back, buddy? Nope. Sorry. He's back. Okay. 
So epiglottitis is a much more severe uh, situation. And again, because we're talking about this, this epiglottis right here, very large, they call it omega shaped on children. Much more severe, sore throat, very red, incredibly painful. So sore throat, fever, cough, they usually will position themselves in this tripod position or in a sniffing position like this and just kind of sit there like the mystics in Dark Crystal. I don't know, that was a very far reference off. But they sit like this, right? And, um, and the reason is they just want the fluid to go down their throats without having to swallow. Why? Because when you swallow, the epiglottis covers the larynx and pops back up. And all of this movement is excruciating. So typically you'll see them tripoding, you'll hear the strider, and also right here, drooling. It hurts so bad to swallow, they literally drool out of their, out the sides of their mouth. So, well, how do you know the difference between croup and epiglottitis then? How are we gonna know? Exactly, that, you, very poignant, we're not, we're not gonna know. So uh, in that case, if, if, if you don't know, what side would you err on if you were worried about this patient? Yeah, the epiglottitis patient, much more worse condition or the possibilities of this getting much worse. We're not going to visualize that area. So is a rapid onset. We don't go in and actually visualize inside the mouth. Any movement, any jostling can cause the larynx, to close, the epiglottis to close over the larynx and get stuck. So we don't do any visualizations. Even as paramedics, we're not supposed to. We have all the tools to do it. We have the laryngoscope and we can go in and look. But you don't want to start meddling with a child's airway when it's all inflamed and they're panicky and, you know, it's just a big, messy situation. In this case, calm everything down, get the patient in the gurney and get going, probably code three. Just, if I see any kid doing this and crying and it's like, that's, that's all I need. That's epiglottitis and we're going code three. Let's see if there's anything else I need to say about this. Yeah, yeah, 12 hours, less than 12 hours. Same thing here, but usually you'll see these, the amount of severity with uh, the, the epiglottitis is much worse. So what do we do for them? Well, we typically don't do much, but as a paramedic, we may try and lubricate the airway by giving saline breathing treatments. We may, depending on the situation, go with albuterol too. If I'm also hearing wheezing, I could give albuterol. You as an EMT, however, can use a breathing treatment. This thing, I don't know what year this was made. I'm guessing when my mom was a nurse because I've never seen that out there. I will show you. But what we do is use humidified high flow oxygen along with saline solution. And the cold misting air really helps to alleviate the pain. So this is typically in the old days when a kid would start coughing and you'd hear that the parents would take them. The doctor lived, you know, six miles away and they were going to walk at it at 4 a.m. So they would take the kid outside in the night, cool, misty air. And that actually would help the croup or the epiglottitis or whatever it happened to be because it's humidifying it. It's nature being your nebulizer. Typically, what? Um, typically this is what your uh, nebulizers look like. You'll see these on the right along. The air comes in through this little port here. You fill the bottom area with saline, and then they breathe off of this, this mask here. This simply blows air out. I never really understood why the hell you'd want this blowing into your face. So usually I'll just take this and tape it back up in front of the patient's face, just flip it back around, then they're getting humidified air all about them, and it's a lovely experience. Sometimes they're not able to hold it. Maybe if it's kids or something, they're not gonna sit there and hold this. Kids get distracted and they just you know, stop doing what they're doing in about a minute and a half. So you gotta figure out another way to do it. 
in which case you can grab a non-rebreather, a pediatric or an adult, depending on if the parent is going to ride along with them. You can always have her or he hold it in front of their kid's face and have um, uh, like, you know, ambient humidified air. Or you can put the smaller one on and you just pop off that little bag, the reservoir down below, pop that one off and you attach this portion underneath the bag. One more thing you have to do is pop the two valves off the sides because it, you can't keep breathing on a non-rebreather without a bag underneath it. It's gonna start sucking closed and then they're not gonna be able to get any more air. So you have to essentially turn the non-rebreather into a rebreather by taking off the two one-way valves and that works just fine. You'll see, you get to play with it. There's a situation, you gotta turn it up to like 10 liters per minute. But when you do that, this is one of the few times you really have to wedge that port you have to get it on the nipple, like all the way to the top, because you're running at such a high speed, it just goes, it pops off, and then you got to run over. And pick it up. So you'll see when you get on your ride alongs. Hey, hopefully you get a sick kid. What a weird, macabre thing to say. I know. I know it's terrible. Uh, or if your patient is an extremist, just for you to understand, we could theoretically take that nebulized treat, uh, treatment put it in line with a bag valve mask and you can positive pressure ventilate a patient through a bag valve mask. It doesn't work so well as we've, we've learned before. This would work a lot better if you get the patient uh, stable enough to breathe more or less independently on their own. You simply hook the nebulizer up to a continuous positive air pressure device and it's forcing humidified oxygen into their lungs. And that works incredibly well. That works great with albuterol. When we get into pulmonary edema because of cardiac issues, um, this, this is a really good life, literal lifesaver. It really is. Okay, RSV or respiratory syncytial virus. I practiced that today. <clears throat> this is an infection, an inflammation of the lungs. Um, RSV is pretty much with younger children and it usually results in some kind of pneumonia or potentially bronchiolitis. Pneumonia is a blanket term. It could be a bacteria, it could be a virus situation, it could be whatever uh, is causing fluid in the lungs. That's really what you're dealing with, pain and fluid in the lungs. And so remember I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, typically it starts in one lung, gets worse and builds up and then migrates over to the second side and then the patient gets significantly worse because it's basically going systemic now. It's not a localized infection. That's the danger with, with pulmonary issues is that the, the blood supply runs right through the lungs at the alveoli and it will take any microbe, any bacteria or virus with it and bring it all throughout the body, like within minutes, within minutes, you can get that happening. And so that's a really bad situation. So, <clears throat> so this is now, we're moving from the upper airway down to the lower airway. The lower airway is from trachea down to the lungs, the, the bifurcation, the right and left main stem bronchi, the bronchi, the bronchi branches into the bronchioles. And remember around those bronchioles is smooth muscle. So it can, it can constrict and dilate according to whatever hormones or drugs we, we pump into the system or the body pumps into itself. And whenever things get bad, usually the body ugh, like tenses up. And so you get an inflammatory response and you get constriction, you get bronchial constriction when you're having some kind of infection in your lungs. It's not a good situation. Bronchiolitis, you're going to hear wheezes and potentially rails or crackles. I've always called them rails, but it crackles. And again, that sounds kind of like they say, grab your, your hair and run it by your ear. It, it, sounds like a, so it sounds like the head of a beer or like a Coke can when you like listen to it, you know? You guys don't listen to your ears? Um, yeah, we used to go to kegs and you take your, the, the oil off your nose and then the head would drop so you could get more beer in it. Anyway, 
<laughs> came from a small town, people. I'm amazed I made it. So, so anyway, that's what rail sounds like. It's this frothy sound. What it really is, it's cytoplasm. It's the fluid in the lungs. And the fluid of the lungs and the fluid in the cells is water, salts, some electrolytes, and proteins. Albumin, which is egg white, is in there. It's very prevalent in cytoplasm. And if you've ever made meringue, all you do is whip up the, the, the uh, albumin and it starts getting frothy and white, and then you can put it on pies or whatever. That's what you're basically doing in the lungs when it fills up with fluid. The albumin within that fluid, as you breathe, air whips in and out, and it starts to create this pulmonary frothy edema that uh, you sometimes even see it come out. Sometimes it's pinkish as it comes out. Seeing like heroin overdoses where this thing sits out like, like the head of, it's crazy. Like it actually comes out like a beer sign and runs down their faces. Um, it's, it's wild to see that. So that's what we're talking about when we say you're hearing rails or crackles. It's frothy, um, it's frothy edema, frothy albumin and, and water and, and electrolytes and things. Okay. <clears throat> Typically, if kids are chronically getting bronchiolitis, just a real quick thing, it's usually a precursor to asthma, childhood asthma. So be on the lookout for that. They do have treatments and therapies now for kids that are, you know, uh, pediatric asthma patients. So the sooner they begin on that stuff, the better. And so the sooner that you realize there's a problem with this person's respiratory system and getting infections all the time, you should probably get them moving on. What do you think the treatment for this stuff typically is? What's that? Like just getting the lungs in shape, getting the lungs able to, to fight off infections. So, sometimes steroids to stop it. But the thing is with steroids is that it then stops your immune system's ability to fight it on their own. But they, you're right. They do start with steroids. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, they do. Any, yeah, you're on antibiotics. It's really, the crazy thing is exercise does incredibly help. I mean, you build up probably the costal muscles. Kids have a really difficult time when there's, when there's swelling in the lungs or respiratory infections, because they don't have a solid rib cage and they don't have other large accessory muscles to, to help in respirations. So we will see something here where you see retractions where the, the literal rib cage sucks in when they breathe. And kids will typically like do belly breathing too. They'll do that when they breathe. I don't know. You'll see it when you now, when now that I've mentioned it. Um, so if that's the case, they're getting rails, you're hearing crackles, consider it a lower respiratory bronchiolitis, probably caused by RSV, and, uh, and treat it. I'm just going to bring them to the hospital. Again, pneumonia is usually a bacterial, but it can be viral as well, excessive mucus production, alveoli may collapse, uh, that's called atelectasis, by the way. What happens is when this stuff gets gummy and, and it hangs onto the alveoli and it doesn't have that smooth surfactant lubrication, the, the actual alveoli pouches, uh, where's my lungs here? These guys, these things just kind of, these little grape bunches kind of close in on themselves and collapse. And that's called atelectasis. Um, you can get collapsed lungs from that. Like they'll say your lower left, lower left base is, is collapsed due to atelectasis. If that were the case, if you had the lower lung portion was collapsed, what kind of lung sounds would you hear? Take a wild guess. Yeah, none. You wouldn't hear anything, which is weird because you're listening and it's like, <laughs> and then you just real distant. Because you're hearing up here through a bunch of junk. With CHF patients? Yeah, yeah. If they're full of like fluid and edema, yeah, it's weird. You hear it and it's real thick and you know, rails and, and then it's like a distant, sounds like, it sounds like you're literally listening to it from underwater. 
it's cool and it's scary. Um, okay, so how do you know this? Well, again, it's potentially something like bronchiolitis. We don't really know. We're not gonna be quite sure if this is a pneumonia or specifically affecting the bronchioles. One way to tell would be if there's significant wheezing, really high level wheezing, more than likely it's bronchiolitis. If they're completely wiped out and I mean, you hearing junk in both lungs and they're staggering and their eyes are half masked, probably some kind of systemic pneumonia. Either way, you're not gonna get faulted for going code three to the hospital. Um, and, and, and could it just be the regular cold, common cold or something like that too? Sure, who knows, we really can't tell. It's gonna be a little bit more significant if it's in the lower airway and you're hearing significant lung sounds or bad lung sounds in the, in the lower airway. Um, but yeah, we, we're just touching on some more, more serious medical conditions here. Case in point, pertussis or whooping cough. This was a big killer back in, you know, all the way up until antibiotics and immunizations began in this century. So this, when you go in and you get the Tdap, used to be called the diptet. The P is standing for pertussis, it's whooping cough. Uh, usually gets kids under six years old, highly contagious, highly contagious. It's a bacterial infection. And again, it's like that flu-like symptoms, fever, runny nose, dehydration, um, but also deadly. So <laughs> don't screw that one up. This typically, because we get immunized, doesn't really show up that often. But now with you know movements for anti-vax and people from other countries coming in, it does start to become more prevalent in areas where you have a lot of immigrants um, living and living on top of each other and things that can spread really rapidly that way. I'll keep doing that. Okay. So with that, you're hearing wheezing, you're, you're, the kid's tired, trying to breathe, it's difficult. You're hearing inspiratory or an expiratory wheezes. Could it be asthma? Could it be bronchiolitis? Could it be, uh, how are you gonna know the difference between bronchiolitis and asthma, between pneumonia and asthma? What's gonna set asthma apart? Probably. That's good. Yeah. Dry cough, probably nothing in there. It's usually not related to a virus or bacteria. It's usually an allergen. It's a body's immunodefense. That's a great way to look at it. You're not going to, uh, they're not, they may not be running, they're probably not going to be running a fever or having flu like symptoms. Another thing is they'll probably have a history of asthma. You know, they know they have it. They got their, ven their Ventolin, their albuterol. So, just by getting a good sample history, we'll be able to start to differentiate between these, these, these uh, illnesses. So as I mentioned, there's a trigger, some kind of allergen, bee pollen or grass or hay or peanuts or shellfish or something. Uh, sometimes again, with kids, uh, uh, exercise induced asthma is pretty prevalent until they get over that hump and really start to use their lungs effectively, then kind of childhood asthma goes away. <clears throat> as well as when you start going through puberty and you start building muscles. Teddy Roosevelt said he attributed the loss of childhood asthma to him working out. So he watched the, sm the strong man come through in the carnival when he was a kid and he said, I wanna be that guy. He was holding like the big round circular weights, you know, the big ball weights. He's going, hop, hop, hey. You know, Wearing like the cheetah singlet, you know? Okay, <clears throat> now this gets a little bit easier to, to diagnose if it is as indeed a, a medical condition that you already know about, like cystic fibrosis. This is a hereditary disease. You need, have, need both parents to have it in order to get it. Uh, if they do, there's a one in four chance of getting, oh, I think I got a video on this as a matter of fact. So what it is, there is a, def a deficit or default rather, or no, what am I saying? A defect 
like my brain, a defect in a cell, a type of cell that produces fluid. It creates like a surfactant type fluid. It's an epithelial cell typically found in the lungs, but also similar cells also line the GI tract. So these people will probably start getting an abundance of respiratory problems and GI problems early in life, which if they didn't catch the fact that cystic fibrosis existed in the kid, they will after they do more extensive testing. Uh, really impedes your ability to be active and you know to thrive through illnesses and injuries. So usually these people aren't able to work out very well. They're usually kind of atrophied simply for the fact that they, they can't breathe very well. It's always impeding them. Sometimes that you can see some kind of hunching and things like that in their body weight. There are incredible <clears throat> therapies for this now. And so people are living much longer. This used to be kind of, you made it to your thirties maybe. And then that was, that's when the serious illnesses started hitting. You. So um, one of the big things that when you wake up in the morning, the, the parents have to stand around and just beat on their sides and kind of knock all the phlegm out from the night before. Every day, you got to sit there and do like an hour long of just cleaning out the respiratory system. It's just brutal. They make machines now that go on like, like the fruit picking or nut picking devices. They just go on and shake the hell out of you and ugh, knocks everything out. Then you got to cough it all up. So again, how do you know? Well, there's an increased incidence of respiratory infections. They're having difficulty breathing. Weakness, fatigue, productive cough, wheezing may, you know, it normally won't be running a fever unless they are having some kind of uh, infection. And you can imagine if this stuff is big and thick and it can't be ejected easily, things are going to get in from normal breathing and start growing in these Petri dishes. And so that's why they're more prone to illness um, throughout their lives. Whoops. All right, let's see. This is a little thing on cystic fibrosis. So we don't, because we don't hear about it enough. Oh no, how do you do it? There we go. Well, guess what? Looks like it didn't pass along. We'll find it. I'm happy. <clears throat> Cystic fibrosis. I think I've had three patients in 20 years. Yeah. Um, and, and again, another thing is they know they have it. So you go in and, you know, um, the, the thing that's not great is you see them very often. So people that have diseases that live in your first response area, you go on them, you go on them, you know, like their whole lives and you, it's, you know, you watch them get worse or you see them get better. It's, it's a whole thing. Now that's a question. Cystic fibrosis is, well, a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Nearly 11,000 in the UK. And in the UK, each week, two people die from CF and five more babies are born with it. Which probably means a lot of you are watching this in search of answers to that big question. So, let's get started. Cystic fibrosis is about genetics. You can't catch it. But if both your parents... Apparently my kid is watching right now and he's screaming at his mom because because uh, he can't talk to her. <laughs> so she just had a giant 15 minute tantrum. He can't talk to her. Thought it would be a good idea. It turned out to be a terrible, terrible decision. <clears throat> Cystic 
Okay. Real quick, again, this is now we're kind of building from pediatric to adult. So we go over H1N1. Typically, it was called the swine flu before. Swine flu. So um, this has come through our culture a couple times. The big one was in 1916, 1917. The, um, the big uh, 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 Spanish flu epidemic. Anybody hear of that? You know what I'm talking about? Hopefully. Wow, good, good. That's something that I didn't know many people are aware of it. Basically killed off. Well, anybody, everybody got it, apparently, in that period of time. And we're alive because our ancestors had the immunity to it. So, so it's good to know. But there are other variations that we come across all the time. And so these little mutations to H1N1, which I'll actually get into just for your own edification, um, are, they, they just pop up. They come around again and again and again. And so depending on how easily they're transmitted and the severity of their, of their symptoms and signs uh, determines their virulence. So swine flu, typically very bad. In fact, in the early 2000s, we thought this was going to come through and rip apart our, our world. I think it was like 2008, 2009, 2010. Didn't, didn't really go anywhere and it kind of just disappeared. And then we had like the, um, the Ebola showed up and everything else. This goes away though. So, but what are you looking for? Well, when it's bad, it's fever, dyspnea, cough, dyspnea, which is, what's dyspnea? Difficulty breathing, good, okay. Sore throat, fatigue. The H1N1 flu in 2016 uh, was, of all of the random things was actually much worse for young adults, for the young and healthy populations. So it was, it, it started, they believe actually in a barracks in the Midwest here as soldiers were training to go to World War I or somewhere around, that's one of the theories. And as they went there, well, they're fighting trench warfare. They're all in close contact. They're laying with thousands and actually millions of dead bodies all around them. And so it's a pretty bad place to, uh, to try and stop infection. It's just not gonna happen. So um, it, it spread through that place like wildfire and it just, it lit up Europe and, and basically the entire world. And it was killing off young, healthy adults. Usually whenever we're talking about illnesses or, and injury for that matter, it's, it's the very young and the very <clears throat> old who suffer the most because the young aren't, they don't have enough built up immunities to things or enough of the fat to rely on if they can't eat or their bodies aren't regulated yet enough. And then once your body starts to deteriorate later in life, then also you're, in, you're at risk of catching life uh, diseases that will kill you and not somebody young and healthy. Not so much the case with H1N1. Of course, now we can test for it. We are always looking for cursors, precursors to this, and, and the CDC is always on the lookout. So we'll hear about H1N1 outbreaks before we probably see any of those patients. Um, whoops. So this is, by the way, the H1N1 refers to these cells, these little receptors off of the cells. So the H1N1 cell has a molecular code on it or a shape that will fit other things onto it. The virus attacks into that. It is able to bind to that cell. And when the virus binds to its cell, it literally injects its RNA into the cell and causes the cell to start building, your body's cell to start building that virus over and over and over again. It's devious. Have you ever seen these little guys, the little virus things? They got like the big trapezoidal head and like the big drill and it lands and like, eh, like drills into the, the, the cell wall, cell membrane. So that's kind of that shape. This is what we have to go through in paramedic school and trying to understand through um, uh, cell respiration, how this works, protein th synthesis, how it gets into the body, makes its way in. You're creating, uh, all right, doesn't matter. Here's, this is what you need to know right here. Some viruses fit, some don't. 
And so what the receptor is doing is it's, it's allowing things in that fit that shape. This would be a molecule. A molecule would fit there and a molecule, which a molecule is just a bunch of elements connected together. And when they connect because of their electron bind, bindings or bonds, they have different shapes. The, the, the parts adhere to different places on each um, atom or each element rather. So that's what they're checking. When you hear H1N1, or in this case, the ACE2 receptor, um, when we're talking about coronaviruses, same idea. It's, that's, the, that's the receptor point where it's affected, hence we call it that name, H1N1 or ACE2. So when we have coronavirus that came through again in the early 2000s, or, or maybe even 2010, 2012, um, SARS, that was a big one. So we were really concerned about that one. That was very, very virulent. It was killing a lot of people, particularly elderly, but it was hard to catch. It was a harder disease to catch. We were still on the lookout for it. And of course we were wearing the, the, the PPE for it. Actually, I don't even think we were wearing masks then. But if we heard a call where they suspected SARS or something, was it was um, potentially the case we had suit up, we'd wear Tyvek suits. I never had to, we never got to that, that level at that point. The novel coronavirus is what we just had. It's the same kind of coronavirus, only this one was much easier to catch. Luckily, it wasn't that deadly because we'd all probably be dead um, because it ripped through this place very quickly. People are still getting it. Nobody's dying from it. There's, there is a group of people Who's, who typically dies from, from coronavirus. Immunocompromised, geriatric, respiratory impaired patients. All of those people are the ones that are suffering. Overweight patients, people whose respiratory system is not robust. Uh, that's a big issue. And then of course, immunities are down. That's gonna be another problem. With so luckily this thing just didn't really do anything to us. And it was particularly good on children, which is crazy. Uh, just how, you know, it, it didn't affect kids. One of the theories is that you can get all sorts of harmless coronaviruses that are like in the dirt and the ground and the playgrounds. And so kids have been getting it for years and they've built up partial immunities to coronaviruses. And so it just didn't hit them with the force that I don't know, maybe our immunities would have because we haven't been around all that dirt and debris for you know decades. And so it's, it's hitting us harder. We've lost all of those antibodies up until then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct, yeah. And one of the theories was that they Mm. Mm -hmm. It's already happened, right, right. Okay, yeah, that's a good theory. I don't know, yeah, it, it, at this point, I've only heard the theories. I haven't heard that one, but that's, that's, that's valid, it makes sense. Um, and so what are we looking for? Um, well, same kind of situation. Oh, and also some people are getting coronavirus GI related illnesses and injuries for the same kind of issue because there's similar cells in the GI tract as in the respiratory tract, much like you saw with uh, pulmonary um, fibrosis, cystic fibrosis, same idea. The same cells, I, like my captain got it and he's like, I just, I just shit my pants for a week and then that was it. But I never got a cough or anything. I'm like, right on. We're, we're talking at the lunch table. Of course, that's what comes up. So, and I didn't know, that was the first time I had heard that. I'm like, are you sure it was Corona? Because that doesn't sound like it. And then, you know, we learn more. You learn. You're like, oh, well, of course, that makes sense. Yeah. What causes lung What I think it's what causes lung coronavirus. Long COVID. I don't know. I, I honestly, I'm not an expert on COVID. I think it's probably they just have a, maybe a lowered immune system, and it takes them longer to process through it. Um, 
I don't know. Anybody? Do you have any more? I like I like where your head's at. You seem to be the the yeah. expert right now. Mm -hmm. um, the long ball is still kind of the yeah. closest I've heard to like why it might be a problem that for individuals maybe you have a like a product ah uh, okay Interesting. Um, and there are theories that a lot of autoimmune diseases are actually triggered by viruses to activate. Yeah, but the, the like link from one to the other argument is here, mm -hmm. whereas this is like, well, there's a clear delineation of I didn't have any disease, mm -hmm. and now I do. Yeah. That's fascinating. Because if you think about it, our DNA is really a collection of everything else, including viruses and bacteria that have come together and recombinated. So like, it, it makes sense that it would suddenly activate with an older, you know, a, a, a sequence. Um, wow. Mm -hmm. Fighting it. Yeah. That was also the theory why the H1N1 was killing young, healthy adults, because their body would like actively, aggressively fight it and on all the complications came from that. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, so in that case, uh, steroids are gonna be your friend, you know? Yeah. That way you just don't allow the, I mean, I, I, I really love hate relationship with steroids, but. Um, it makes sense. It definitely makes sense. There's a theory. I mean, when I first studied this in the nineties, they, they, you know, one of the leading theories was diabetes is caused by a virus. You contract it, which makes sense in this case, if it's activating some kind of dormant cell DNA uh, in the pancreas that suddenly now everything starts transferring back into an unhealthy goblet cell. So it makes sense. It's, it's totally amazing. You know about CRISPR? You guys know about CRISPR? Blow your own minds tonight. Go home and look up CRISPR, C-R-A-S-P-R. I think that's how you do it, right? Yeah. Uh, that's going to be a cheap and easy way to hack our bodies, I bet, in like 50 years. I can guarantee it. It's psychotic. It's so cool. <clears throat> oh, so here's, a, here's a, a coronavirus, just for your, for your own knowledge. All these little spiky bikies all over. When you look at them in a two-dimensional shape, that looks like a halo or a corona. So that's why they call it a coronavirus. So there can be many different coronaviruses. It's just kind of shaped. It's like bacteria. You have bacillus, kind of those long rod-looking things. You have staph or lecocal strands, which are little balls that lock up together. So there are different shapes to all of this stuff. So that's where they're getting all of these names. If you were ever curious about H1N1 or Corona, or the fact that it's called a novel coronavirus because novel simply means new. So it's just the, the new coronavirus. Check it out. It's like new Coke. Nobody liked it. <laughs> okay, where are we? All right. So now we're getting a little bit more into the adult respiratory emergencies. And as I mentioned, by the way, there's plenty of normal mundane calls for random flus and colds. And most of the time that's our bread and butter. You're running calls, you know, for 12 hours or 24 or 48 hours. And, and a lot of it is code two transports. A lot of it is patient reassurance and we're going there just to be safe on the, you know, and, and so just keep that in mind, but don't fall prey to laziness and go, it's probably fine. Because we might start running on these situations here, like it is an H1N1 first arrival. When in, San, in San Jose, we had among the first patients of coronavirus because it came in through San Jose Airport. And one of the guys that got it worked at the TSA, gave it to everybody in the TSA. 
and they were passing it along to all the patients as they walked through and um it got pretty hairy we were pretty afraid for a while the first three or four months um and, and that's the reason you don't know so don't start falling victim to just going that's probably nothing you get you know there's this weird i'll just say this at about a year and a half to two years in, everybody starts thinking they're an old salty veteran, like they know everything. Like, ah, I've been around, I've seen it. It's like, you haven't even gotten two toes into EMS. So do not start acting like you got it made, you got it handled. Like your whole world's about to explode about 40 other times before you can say you're a veteran. So typically if that starts becoming you, that means you need to study more. You need to become a paramedic. It means you need to pick up some other facet of the job um, or come and teach because you know, you got to stay, you got to stay on your toes and we have to be able to look for this stuff because when you miss something out there and it's life threatening and you miss it, you will never forget that. And hopefully you don't kill your patient because of your laziness. So I've scared you enough. As I mentioned before, make sure you're getting lung sounds on all of these patients, respiratory illnesses, respiratory difficulty, whether or not it's, it's cold-like symptoms, whether or not it's fever, be listening to all of these access points on the body. All right, I'm gonna keep saying it. So we get in quickly to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease as a blanket term. By the way, if you ever hear things like syndrome, that is a blanket term, like pneumonia actually is a blanket term too, but it means that there's a number of different illnesses that could be linked to whatever that is. In this case, pulmon pul uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD is a chronically obstructed respiratory system that can usually be tied to two major respiratory illnesses. One of them is chronic bronchitis, and the other one is emphysema. <clears throat> Go over chronic bronchitis first. These people have, in, they have constantly inflamed bronchial trees. They are irritated, they're swelling, there's a lot of mucus production because of the irritation. It's causing a lot of difficulty to breathe, and these people really become kind of sedentary, and don't work out and lay around. Uh, they lay around all the time. Not everybody, I wouldn't generalize, but we always do generalize in the EMS. And so we call them blue bloaters and you'll see why. Well, they're not getting enough air. They're not getting enough oxygen. And so they're able to blow off carbon dioxide, but not, not take in enough oxygen. And so they become cyanotic. They're, they're basically kind of bluish, a little bit tacky touching, skin and they tend to be overweight because of inactivity so what we're seeing though is the alveoli still work fairly well so they're still able to exchange the gases across the membrane the only issue is getting it from the outside in past the swollen mucousy bronchi into the alveoli to then blow it out does that make sense it's just it's getting you're not getting enough oxygen because it has to go through something like this rather than something like this, okay? So it's tight. And so the oxygen is like sucking through a stir stick rather than sucking through a slurpy straw. Much harder to do. You can't get enough oxygen. Hence, you become cyanotic, you become blue, and you're not able to work out too much. That compared to emphysema or pink puffers is a condition of the alveoli themselves, the, the actual gas exchange, exchange chambers right here are damaged. It's usually due to tar or something that got inside there and just ate away at that membrane. And just for you to know, this absolutely needs to be nice and clean. All of the chambers opened up Atelectasis, not a problem, right? Remember, atelectasis is those things have collapsed. So you don't want atelectasis. You don't want mucus involved in any of that in these areas. You don't want fluid building up along the edges. Um, you can see here, sorry, I'm going to walk right up into your face. But along these lines here, the alveoli 
the alveolar sac butts up against the pulmonary circulation. And it's basically one molecule at a time passes over these areas. It drops off oxygen, it takes in carbon dioxide. There is an end of the alveoli and then there are little blood vessels. And so there's this, a couple of membranes that they have to go through. But if those membranes start to swell or fluid gets between those membranes, you ain't getting any diffusion of gases and you're in big trouble. So with COPD, it's an actual damaged alveolus that's causing this problem. So who gets it? Well, black lung because of the tar and the gunk that sits in there from smoking or from working in coal mines, just that soot physically blocks. It gets in and cakes up the alveoli. Another one would be like if you're in a fire and you take in superheated oxygen or superheated air, or you take in some kind of chemical that's burning in the environment, you pull it in and that etches away at the alveoli. It literally eats through it. There was a fire crew in San Jose that they were on a fire and they, this was, I think in the eighties, they didn't all have uh, SCBAs, nor was anybody wearing them. And they got into a fire and did something. And as soon as they all came out, they were at sports boys. I'm like, God, that was terrible. I think every single one of the crew, even like the 20 year olds got COPD within like two years. It just, whatever the chemical was, they said it was like a, a bluish red smoke. It was like purpley coming out. And then it, I was like, you didn't think that anyway. You know, it's a weird culture. They didn't have, they had one SCBA, I think, per each crew and one radio. SCBAs are the packs you wear, the air packs that you, you know, the Darth Vader thing. Um, we're lucky enough to have like backups of all of those and everything. And, and I think the culture's changing. So we're going to be, you should be wearing these on all these calls, even if you're not really worried. Anyway. So what can cause this? The long way to say toxic air or, or, or caustic air, mustard gas to bring back World War I again, just chlorine, chlorine gas is what mustard gas is. It's yellowish when it floats in the air. And it eats away at all of those delicate material, all those little cells and tissues. And so it damages it. So what are we looking at? Well, here's our blue bloater. Here's our pink puffer. So what happens with the pink puffer? Well, they can't get enough oxygen across the membranes. So their, your body starts to produce more red blood cells so that every time some blood goes across that membrane there, there's a higher chance that it will diffuse some oxygen across. So you're not getting enough. So your body makes more red blood cells because more red blood cells, as you know, carry oxygen and carbon dioxide for that matter, to and from the, the, the lungs. So you become flushed red color because you literally have more red blood cells floating around. The other thing, because these alveoli are damaged, they kind of collapse down. And a way to fix that is when you breathe, you purse your lips and you create a back pressure in your lungs. So if you're breathing out smaller, you do that, you can feel your lungs literally get bigger. They swell up. And that's what pink puffing was all about. That was, that was the style back then, Get. Um, <laughs> they would breathe as they breathe, they go. And that's, you'll see a lot of them, if they are in any kind of respiratory distress, will purse their lips, create a smaller opening, and it opens up your lungs so that they're able to exhale out the carbon dioxide and get in the oxygen. So that's where the pink puffing name came from. You can see they usually have almost no fat on their systems because of the, maybe presumably the added exertion from having to breathe like this. Uh, usually if you're not, you're not comfortable, you know, you probably don't eat as much. A lot of these people still smoke. It's crazy. I guess they figure they're already there. Might as well. Um, another thing to look at, because they're working so hard to breathe, their costal muscles get much larger and they get kind of a barrel chest. So you'll see these kind of, see this, like the shoulders are really high. All of these are accessory muscles. So all of these muscles grow in size because they're breathing harder, the exertion that it takes. 
clear as mud, you get it? Okay, so the big thing to take away, pink puffers is emphysema, and that is uh, alveolar damage. Blue bloaters, chronic bronchitis, and that's typically big, swollen, mucousy bronchioles. One of them are the tubes to get to this one, the other one is the end result, the end, uh, the end of the road. How are we feeling? Because now we're about to go deep. This is gonna get good. I've talked about the hypoxic drive before. Do you remember? Do you remember what triggers the body to breathe normally? The brainstem. The brainstem is measuring the pH, the percentage of hydrogen, the acidity, and the alkalinity of the cerebral spinal fluid. And when it becomes more acidic, you're triggered to breathe. So whenever the, C8, the CSF level starts to become acidic, that is go from seven down to one, you, you, it triggers your body, hey, there's too much acid, blow it off. You can do that because carbon dioxide is acidic. So CO2 is acidic. So what we're really relying on is an increase in CO2 levels in the cerebral spinal fluid to trigger the chemoreceptors to tell the body, start breathing more, we're filling up with carbon dioxide, we're becoming acidic, blow it off. Are you with me so far? Carbon dioxide levels increasing is what triggers healthy people to breathe. Your carbon dioxide drive or your, your, your carbonic drive, some people call it. Um, okay, but let's take the pink puffer. This person and the blue bloater aren't able to blow off all of their carbon dioxide because they have all of these damaged alveoli and their damaged bronchial trees. So they start to build up with carbon dioxide. They have an increased amount of carbon dioxide just chronically through their systems for until they die, they're gonna have that problem because they just can't breathe like that. So after about a year or two years, the body no longer can rely on this increased carbon dioxide level to breathe. The receptors just kind of wear out and they're like, yeah, we've been telling you there's too much carbon dioxide and you're just not able to breathe hard enough. So they kind of get, um, what would you call it? Desensitized to the fact that there's higher levels of carbon dioxide in the system. So that reflex kind of dies off it starts to wane and not work effectively anymore. We're not breathing, these pink puffers, blue bloaters, not breathing because there's higher amounts of carbon dioxide. They've had higher carbon dioxide levels for years. And so the sensors burn out. So there's another system built in, a backup mechanism. Where'd it go? Called, no, well, it's not in here. I'll write it in called the hypoxic drive, okay? The hypoxic drive is exactly what it stands for. When the oxygen levels go down, that also triggers people to breathe. So normal healthy people breathe because of an increase in carbon dioxide, but people that chronically have respiratory issues and retain carbon dioxide don't use that reflex, they use the hypoxic drive. Where is it? Okay, I will pull something up on it real quick and let you see how this works. Here's the problem. Look at this, so they run at a low hypoxic level regularly. Here's an issue that we come across with, carbon, with COPD patients. Remember I always said oxygen, was it? Blood goes round and round, air goes in and out and oxygen is good. That's a bottom line, that's what we need to know, right? In this situation, oxygen may not be super good because let's say I have a patient who's in COPD and they're having difficulty breathing and I put a non-rebreather on their face because they're not breathing well. I want them to breathe, I want them to get oxygen. I put non-rebreather on this patient's face. They're getting 15 liters a minute, they're getting plenty of oxygen. Okay, good, they're in good shape. 
Now their hypoxic level or their oxygen SpO2 is somewhere in the 90s, 94, 96, 98, maybe even 99 or 100. Well, in order for this patient to be triggered to breathe, that SpO2 level, that oxygen saturation level, needs to drop somewhere below 90. And that's not happening. They're not gonna drop below 90 if you're giving them high flow oxygen. Their oxygen level is gonna sit up high in the 90s. So they're not gonna need to breathe very often. They're just kind of, all right, I feel good. Nothing's triggering me to breathe. Well, meanwhile, remember respiration is as much blowing off carbon dioxide as it is taking in more oxygen. Well, what's now building up in my system? Carbon dioxide. And when you get an increase in carbon dioxide, it causes increased level of, of, of mental um, obtundedness and you start to become altered and you start to get dizzy and you start, and eventually you'll pass out. You just have too much, it's, it's too much acid in the system. It's why you're just gonna knock yourself out. You need to blow all of that off and they're not triggered to blow all of that off because their oxygen levels are up and nothing else is able to trigger them to breathe hard. So they noticed when you gave a COPD patient high flow oxygen, at some point they'd go into just narcosis and then knocked out. And you're like, what the hell's going on? Well, look at the O2. Oh, their O2 sitting at 99. I don't know, it seems fine. And then, you know, they just stop breathing. Well, if that's the case that happens to you, take them off oxygen and maybe bag them a little bit with room air. Let the oxygen levels drop and then they can start breathing. It'll trigger them to start breathing again when the oxygen hypoxic drive activates at a lower SpO2. Okay, that's D. What, what, give, give me some questions, because I know that was it, was, it was, it was pretty good. I'm a great lecturer, but I know that there's issues here. So what, where did I miss? What did I miss with that? Do you get it? So normally increased levels of CO2 is what we trigger to breathe. But if you live at increased levels of CO2, that doesn't work anymore. Instead, low levels of oxygen is what triggers those people to breathe. So if they don't have low levels of oxygen, they're not triggered to breathe. And the CO2 goes up, and the CO2 goes up, and their level of consciousness goes down. Yeah. So... See, yeah, so COPD patients, typically we just don't put them on high flow oxygen. Usually they're on their own oxygen and we'll keep them at that level and just try and stop them from shortness of breath. If it is shortness of breath, maybe it's from you know an asthma attack or it's like a pink puffer that's really congested. We give out buterol and that'll open it up. I did have a patient in Tiburon when I started in 04 and this exactly happened and nobody had any knowledge of COPD with this patient. And so we're running all of this and I was, I was a volunteer, but I remember like giving oxygen and she's talking to us and she's like, uh, she kept knocking out and we're like, Hey, and they're waking her up. So we went down the AEIOU tips route. We went down the, what me mental level, you know, what's your ALOC? What's your altered level of consciousness protocol? Alcohol, didn't smell like alcohol. E, epilepsy, no history of epilepsy. I, insulin, what's your sugar? It was like 140, it's fine. So you're like, what the hell's going on? And then you're like, okay, I, O, U, urema, no, it doesn't have anything. Oxygen, is she hypoxic? No, it's, she's sitting at 99, there's no way. Um, and we transported, and I think we were bagging the patient, I can't remember, but we got there and they're like, she had CO2 levels, they're usually between 35 and 45. There were like 160, <laughs> this huge amount of carbon dioxide in the system. And, um, and we only found out because went, we went back to the hospital with another call. And they're like, yeah, she just wasn't breathing. Now we carry an end tidal CO2 detector. It's an electronic thing that hooks up to the monitor. And every respiratory patient you get, it's attached to a nasal cannula. So you put that thing on and boom, you're getting oxygen and carbon dioxide levels. And that is awesome to see. You can also attach it to an endotracheal tube or a bag valve mask for that matter. So whenever, whatever's being exhaled out, it will read it on a waveform capnography. What's really cool about that, and I don't wanna freak people out too much, but 
when you go, because it's a little bit deep in the woods here, but uh, you intubate a patient who's in cardiac arrest. You got them intubated, someone's bagging that patient. You're looking at that CO2 is in line and you're looking and their CO2 level is like 10, 12. And you're doing CPR and you're given the drugs and then suddenly you look over and the CO2 level is at like 98. So what the hell happened? Why was it at 12 and then 98? Good, that's a good thought, but it would still stay low if it were that, right? Usually it is, you've resuscitated that patient. You brought him back to life. And what's happened is their heart triggered up and started all the stuff moving and all that waste CO2 product that had been sitting in there since they died starts going through the system and starts coming out the lungs. And so when you see that and you're like, oh, oh, hang on, hang on, check a pulse. 90 times out of 10, out of 100, you're going to have a pulse back wild so it's a good indicator to tell you oh we might have gotten return of spontaneous circulation which has happened a few times it's always it and it's a great indicator that i've intubated into the lungs by the way too so that's always like reassuring you know even though you know you see it and you do it you're like okay i'm in um incidentally this high carbon dioxide response to breathe is also why diabetics in keto acidosis are triggered to breathe very rapidly because the same chemoreceptors measuring carbon dioxide, pH, are also measuring that. And it happens to be the, um, the ketones in the system that are acidic. And so your body's saying, you're acidic, blow off carbon dioxide. That's always the reason that you're acidic, except this time, because you have, you have, you have acid in your system, you have ketones running through. So that's why you'll see like Kuzmal respirations with somebody with their blood sugars are very, very, very high. Sugar itself is, you know, it's, a, it's an acid, you know, ketones and sugar. Anyway, okay. So how do we feel about hypoxic drive? You feeling okay? Should I, no? Yeah, all right, all right. So just remember uh, hypoxic drive COPD. And you can go over that again with friends and work through that. Um, yeah, okay, so now pulmonary edema. Well, it's the accumulation of fluid within the alveolar capillary membrane and the alveoli, basically all through here. And depending on the extent, it kind of just follows gravity and fills up wherever the person is. If you're standing, it's gonna collect at the bases. If you're laying down, it's gonna collect on the posterior portion of the body and it can sit in there. Um, depending on what the reason behind it is, also depends on how serious the pulmonary edema is. <clears throat> uh, okay, so as I mentioned before, these proteins, the albumin molecules are whipping around and clinging to one another and trapping air in between them. And so you get this big frothy edema that starts to whip up in the lungs. At first, that edema sounds like rails. You're hearing crackles, you're hearing rails flowing through frothy suds. As those sit and dry out and become viscous, then you start to hear alveoli. I'm sorry, you hear ronchi. Um, it's possible to hear all of these things at the same time, depending on the extent of the, the infection. You can hear ronchi, what, rails, and wheezes. You know, it's very common to hear that in severe patients. So, Usually for a respiratory in origin pulmonary edema, meaning a respiratory issue that's causing the edema, it's usually um, some kind of pneumonia. It's usually pneumonia. When it's cardiogenic in nature, meaning that it's the heart not pumping adequately the return blood supply from the lungs to get to the system, there's a buildup. That's usually something called congestive heart failure or CHF. I don't think we've gotten into that yet, have we? Did you touch on that yet? No, okay. Because there's left-sided and there's right-sided and that is another kind of conceptual puzzle to get through. So uh, we'll get to that. There's no reason to tackle that tonight. Just know usually left-sided heart failure, that's the spot where the blood's returning from the lungs, right? It goes from the right side of the heart to the lungs and then collects back to the left side of the heart. Usually, if there's a heart attack happening somewhere on the left side, the heart's 
flailing and it's just not pumping effectively. And so the blood starts to build up back into the pulmonary system and it starts to just kind of flood into the lungs. And so you get this little bit bloody fluid filling into the lungs. So you get this kind of pink sputum from that pulmonary edema. That is a bad situation because now this patient is starting to literally drown on their own bodily fluids. And in order to fix that, we need to act fast, deal with it. There are also non-cardiogenic ways to get this acute respiratory distress syndrome, which usually is, again, it's a syndrome. So it usually has to do with something like um, toxic inhalation, aspiration, you've choked and pulled something into your lungs and it's irritating the lungs. Uh, and it's causing your lungs to, you know, get irritated and break apart and fill up with fluid and become inflamed or drowning, you know, particularly uh, saltwater drowning. Salt water gets inside there and it starts to draw all your bodily fluids into the lungs because of osmosis. So drowning and near drowning patients can drown on their own fluids because of that. And high altitude pulmonary edema which a lot of mountain climbers uh, are potentially able to get simply for the fact that um, the atmosphere is outside the body. How does this work? Because you're at a, a less atmosphere, everything just starts to kind of leak out of your, your, your tissues. And so it starts to leak from your pulmonary uh, arteries and veins into your lung. They just fill up with fluid. You can also get high altitude cerebral edema, HACE, for the same idea. There's, there's literally no atmospheric pressure holding the blood in the blood, in the cells, in the blood supply. That's crazy. Like you can be affected by altitude, you know? Um, yes. Yep. So dry drowning can be a couple of things. Yeah, that's a good point. That's actually, Dry drowning usually refers to the fact that you have a, a, an epiglottic laryngeal spasm because you start to take in water and your, and your epiglottis locks over your lungs and it simply won't allow any. And so you, you suffocate because your, your body went into a spasm. That's usually dry drowning. But this is like salt water drowning where you don't technically drown it's the fluid now starts to fill up. You know, you didn't drown in seawater, you drowned in some partial seawater and that pulled all the other fluid from your body into your lungs. Very crazy. AR. Oh, sorry, yeah, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is again, it's a syndrome that a lot, these are all entailed in it. Yeah, 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 exactly. So yeah, so it's a syndrome, meaning there are certain things that their body, you know, it treats certain things very similar. And so that's one of them. You know, it could be a COVID situation, and the body just attacks and you get this sudden acute, I mean, sudden respiratory distress, usually with flooding fluids, um, uh, uh, histamines and, you know, inflammation. So what do you expect to hear in this case? Well, as I mentioned, shortness of breath, rails initially, potentially ronchi afterwards, uh, pedal edema, and JVD. And these refer to CHF. Depending on where the heart is dying, depending on where the injury is, if it's a new or old injury, or if it's an old injury being exacerbated by new injury, meaning you've had a heart attack before and now you're having another one. If it's on the right side, you typically get pedal edema. The fluid builds up in the body. If you, get, if you have a heart attack on the left side, it builds up in the lungs. And I'll let you figure out why that is. Why, why, would, it, why would right-sided heart failure cause fluid to collect in the body and left-sided causes fluid to collect in the lungs? Good question. What? Yeah, well, if the heart's dying on the right side and it's not pumping the blood that's getting to it, where's the blood coming from that gets to the right side? It's 
it's the whole body, right? It's the whole systemic blood flow going into the upper and lower vena cava and filling into the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart can't move it forward. It just starts traffic jamming back into the rest of your body. And it fills up and it pops out of your blood vessels and it just collects down where gravity is. Hence, pedal edema. These people also have something called nocturnal dyspnea, which is, all right, we can still talk about this because it is about respiratory, where they're laying down at night, nocturnal dyspnea. They're laying down at night. They have fluid collecting in their body. It's going down towards gravity. Fluid starts to fill up in their back thoracic area and back into their lungs. Lungs shrink in size. They wake up, they can't breathe. And they tell you, I went to the window and I just, I opened up the window and I've been sitting like this for 20 minutes, or 10 minutes until you, you got here. And it's gotten better. I think it's the night air. In this case, it's not the night air. It's the fact that they got out of bed and walked to the window and opened it and they're tripoding to help breathe. And the fluid is draining from the back of them down into their butt and down their legs. So they're changing where the fluid is collecting. Okay, that's called nocturnal dyspnea. Let's not get too far into the weeds on that. Uh, let's take a break. So what, how's, how are you feeling? So far good on hypoxic drive and every, and um, okay. So we got that great lecture, everybody. Good night. Just kidding. <laughs> So pneumothorax, when they're talking about spontaneous pneumo, the good news is we will go back to this in trauma because that's usually when you see all these, the stabbings, the shootings, the sucking chest wounds that cause the pneumothoraces. So again, with this, it's usually some kind of genetic factor or it's a issue with lung, um, damaged lungs from previous injuries or from smoking or an elderly person who has COPD. That's another big time possible pneumothorax patient. So we're looking for a history that explains why they would have had a pneumothorax. We're looking for chest pain with shortness of breath, unilateral lung sounds. Um, oftentimes it's a sharp pain, not a diffuse or heavy pain. So you're able to do your OPQ or ST and go, doesn't sound cardiac, sharp. Usually sharp and, you know, can mean vessels or lungs, not usually heart. Not always, you can't generalize that well. I mean, there's all sorts of, diabetics have weird presentation. Women have tons of, they always want you to dig deeper. That was a joke, people. It wasn't very good, I'm gonna get fired. Okay, um, so, so that's it. No, those are character, usually they're like the silent MIs, so we miss them. But typically you start looking for other things, cyanosis, and then this is a really big indicator, JVD, jugular vein distension. We've been saying this throughout the year, jugular vein distension, what is it? Well, it's blood backing up into your jugular veins. In this case, because the air would be smushing everything over to the right side, and that's smushing down on the, the uh, vena cava, the jugular veins. So they're getting smashed before they can drain blood into the heart. And so because it's building back up, it starts to swell those jugular veins. And so you see jugular vein distension. Not always from pneumothoraces. It can be from pericardial tamponade. It could be from CHF. But it's one of those things that fits in the Venn diagram of respiratory emergencies to think, okay, I do have JVD. What are the possibilities of this? And am I seeing JVD with difficulty breathing? Because that's a big indicator that it's a pneumothorax and it's not like pericardial tamponade. Uh, late signs of this would be tracheal deviation. The trachea will literally deviate to the unaffected side as everything gets pushed over. It's like an anchor. It just kind of pulls the stem of the trachea over. Um, To tension, it's, yeah. That's right, yeah. So tracheal deviation is a very, very late stage sign of, in fact, um, 
saw it one time, the person was already dead, like long dead. So I don't even wait for tracheal deviation, but it's on national registry, so I should tell you that. Um, usually your deciding factors are distant to absent lung sounds. Blood pressure drops below 100 systolic. Some people say 90, I say 100, play it safe. Your blood pressure should not be dropping below 100 if you're dying and trying to live. And that's happening because it's just smooshing down all of the blood supply and so you're just not pumping enough blood to keep your blood pressure up. Bad news. Of course, accessory muscle use, retractions, lung sounds, you're looking for all sorts of things that indicate respiratory distress along with it. And then pulmonary embolism is another situation. In fact, it's funny that they said smoking for this. Because usually the big risk factor for pulmonary emboli is, is smoking. So this is the case that blood has sat somewhere in your system for a period of time. And when blood sits, especially if you're taking medications and other chemicals that, um, that will uh, promote clotting, you're going to start building clots. Pulmonary embolism is usually a clot that started somewhere in your body, usually in the venous system, somewhere down in the lower circulatory area where you are possibly inactive for a period of time, like the thighs and the legs and or the hips. And it's due to, uh, and they can get large enough to, to float around and cause damage. So you get uh, this, what it is, it's initially called a thrombus. It's a blood clot that begins to build in some of the venous system. As the blood is returning to the heart, that little thrombus breaks off and becomes an embolus. And so, so have you ever heard of like deep vein thrombosis? That's, um, that's a big problem. That's a genetic disorder that they have prevalent clotting in their system. So that clot that's growing in their deep vein breaks off and starts traveling up to the heart. The, 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 uh, the vessels are getting larger and larger and larger as you go to the heart. They're all coming together into the vena cava and then they go up into the right atrium and they get pumped into the right ventricle and then they go out towards the lungs. Now everything starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller and that blood clot eventually lodges like a jackknife semi-truck in one of those pulmonary circulatory vessels. And now you start getting a buildup of pressure behind that spot. That area begins to fill up with blood and you start getting chest pain. And you also begin to start creating pulmonary edema, uh, if you if possibly, and you lose the return of blood flow back to the heart because it's getting stuck behind this giant blood vessel. How big? Well, I'll show you in a minute. This very rarely can be treated any other way than immediate surgery. So these are patients where we are looking for chest pain that is not heavy, but sharp. Oftentimes sharp chest pain with shortness of breath, also with hypotension, with low blood pressure, sudden onset, they can pinpoint where it is. It's right here, and then point to it. And that's probably, more often than not, that's where the clot is. So they're, they're pointing to where that thing is, where it exists. Um, and if you don't get them moving to the hospital and it stays in that pulmonary system, it's, it's a matter of time before it completely can shut down or lodge deep enough to block off enough blood supply that you're not getting any blood back to the heart and the patient's going to die from hypoxia or you know, from hypoperfusion of some kind. Interest. And so here are some other risk factors that we should think about. Recent surgery. Why is that? Well, because you lay sedentary as you heal. And so the blood can pool and clot. Anytime you're doing something sedentary, like sitting down at an office job or people that maybe take long flights to go do their job somewhere, Australia and back, you know, Europe and back, and they're just sitting in their chair for eight, 10, 14 hours, whatever it happens to be, plenty of time for you to grow a clot if you have these, these other genetic conditions. Um, long bone fractures, well, yeah, because that long bone is stuck like that and it's gonna cause a clot. Pregnancy, 
And that goes along also with contraceptives. When you are pregnant, your body creates more blood clots. And that's what stops you from excessively bleeding out if something were to happen. So your body is more inclined to create uh, clotting hormones. And I don't know if you know how birth control works, but birth control basically tricks your body into thinking you're pregnant. So that's what those, those, the medication that it, it is, is literally telling your body, or oh, we're producing this hormone, you're pregnant. And then three weeks of that, and then there's one week of just of salt tablets or sugar, or whatever you take, that's placebo. And then your body goes, all right, that's a period, didn't happen, move on, menses happens, and then you start all over. So contraceptives mimic the same hormones as pregnancy, and that's why that's also bad. Also, tobacco use here, and postpartum, because you can still bleed from postpartum. So imagine somebody who is, you know, young woman taking contraceptive pills, smokes, is a high-end job, travels around the world. You're, that's three strikes. Really, really dangerous risk factor. So if you go on those situations, you're dealing with those calls, you know, consider the history. That's somewhere, that sample history, recent events, you know, um, that plays a huge role in how we determine what's going on with that patient. Whereas most of the time you're like, I don't, what do you mean? I don't care where you recently traveled to. That means nothing. Oh, but it certainly does with pulmonary embolism. Certainly does if you're dealing with respiratory illnesses too. Okay, so this is it. Basically this embolism started, this thromb, it's a thrombus as it sits and then it's an embolus the moment it becomes mobile. So it's going up, getting into larger and larger vessels into the femoral uh, veins up into the inferior vena cava, into the right side of the heart. Goes up into the heart and it's gonna try and move through these chambers to get to the lungs. But as it goes through, it, if it were this size, I mean, it's not getting through this area. It's gonna shut that off entirely and you're probably gonna go dead. If it breaks little bits and pieces off, it can go up into the lungs and start to branch and fill up all of these chambers, these arteries with the clots. And now you're dealing with a life-threatening issue that needs to have emergency surgery to deal with that. Sometimes they're small enough to give them clot busters, the same kind of thing they would give the stroke patients where it would just, it basically emulsifies the clot. Other times they have to go in and kind of uh, suck them out. Other times they go in and, and pull them all out, depending on how it is. Other times, uh, I had a buddy just now, a firefighter who had hip surgery. He's only 50. Anyway, had hip surgery, went home, and then started feeling chest pain a couple of days later and just toughed it out. And, and the nurse came and saw him after the weekend. She said, what's going on? I said, his wife goes, he had chest pain. And they checked him out, brought him in the hospital. He had two giant thrombuses growing and didn't tell anybody. He had thrown one, went into his heart, his body dealt with it, but he had two of them growing in his hips. And uh, about two weeks ago, he finally had surgery. What blew me away is that they knew about it and just said, you're fine, go home. We're scheduled surgery for you in three weeks. Uh-huh. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, that's what I said. I actually talked to the nurse and she was screaming at me. She's like, I'm telling the dog to do that too. So apparently they had him on a lot of blood thinners for the time being. So Coumadin is basically aspirin. It's like nuclear aspirin. So Coumadin or Warfarin is like a very strong antiplatelet. So they kept down any further aggregation of that clot. They kept it from growing any larger. They had him sedentary the whole time. I mean, that's what I, I know. And I kept thinking like, well, what does this mean? I mean, how, how do they know you're not gonna throw it? And I said, well, I think they're, he's not a great historian either. So it was like, you're trying to get this one. He's like, yeah, I don't know, I don't know Kenny. I mean, I, I don't know. they said they, they get it. So I'm not worried about it. You fall it. Yeah. How common is pulmonary They're more common than you think. They are more common than you think. I've seen, I don't know, five or six in my career, probably. And that's just me. You could tell like, like every single time or was there like... No, I couldn't. There, I mean, there's one that basically, um, well, one of them I know died 
because that we she lost steady pulse. So you, it's interesting. You go into you if you lose return blood back to your heart, and now you're feeling this patient and they're dead, and you put them on the EKG to shock them, and it's a regular normal rhythm. You can't shock it, and you go, "What's going on here?" I mean, she doesn't have a pulse. She's dead. No, the heart's working. So usually, if that's the case, it's not the heart's fault. Heart's doing everything it can. There's no blood getting to the heart. It's just like a dry pump where there's no water getting to the pump. It's just firing off and there's no fluid to move around because it's all blocked up behind this clot. So that's what we call pulseless electrical activity, PEA. Now, interestingly enough, pulmonary embolism is one of the few times you can save someone's life by doing CPR. Just CPR, no shocking. Usually you have to shock the heart to get it to work and do this. With this, if it's within the right size and you're doing effective comp compressions, you can physically move blood beyond the clot in the chest and get it around the clot to get it back to the heart so the heart can pump it around. And there have been a couple cases where people showed up to start doing CPR and the person woke up. Went, I'm all, ow, 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 stop. And they'd stop and then they would die again because the clot was stuck there. And so they're doing this the whole way to the hospital, fighting the person to keep them alive, to push blood around the clot until they can get into the hospital and tear the chest open and do the surgery on. So that might be a fun ride along, huh? <laughs> yeah. They have, um, I think probably the uh, echocardiograms can do it. Obviously, they bring them in and they're looking for different signs and symptoms. Like I said, um, you know, tachypnea, breathing hard, chest pain, sharp chest pain. What else? Pain, numbness and tingling to the hands and feet. Oh, sorry. That's hyperventilation. Um, so pain, so chest pain, tachycardia is the basic ones right there. Um, and as I said, like sharp pointing chest pain hypotensive, they start to drop in pulse, in, or, uh, in blood pressure rather, pulse picks up. I think also that with you, a good sample history kind of leads people along the lines towards pulmonary embolism. Um, before we get, uh, I'll show you a, a PE surgery in a minute. The last thing to talk about is hyperventilation syndrome. This is what we used to call an anxiety attack, same idea. It feels like you can't breathe, people are panicked. There's a huge amount of epinephrine running through people's bodies when this is going on. Um, when you ask them to breathe, they say, can't breathe. I don't know what's going on, I just can't breathe. It's just hard to breathe. You listen to lung sounds, lung sounds are clear. Um, you start talking to them, they're speaking in full sentences. And then maybe it's not so much they can't breathe, it's that they can't catch their breath. Um, and usually these are triggered by some kind of traumatic event or memory of a traumatic event, or just how tough life is at that moment. You know, something overwhelms the body. The body excretes a huge amount of epinephrine and nor norepinephrine, causing your body to feel like you're in fight flight mode and something's wrong. And your body's tricking your body into thinking there's something wrong. And so you start breathing faster and your heart races. And then you go, well, my heart's going fast. It's gotta be something's wrong. What the hell's going on? And you're breathing faster. And then as you breathe faster, you blow off all your extra carbon dioxide. So now you're actually low in carbon dioxide. You become more alkaline you become, because you're taking in oxygen and your oxygen levels are higher than your carbon dioxide. And when your body has high alkaline or a high uh, uh, oxygen, uh, a high oxygen situation, you start to get tingling hands and feet and potentially your muscles start to lock up. So when you have no acid in your system, you get these spasms where the hands start to clunk, you know, the ball up and the feet, your little toes go down and cause like those little feet Charlie horses, you know that feeling? That sucks. And it can even, it happens in all the fine-tuned motor muscles. So fingers, toes, mouth. Uh oh So what happens in your mouth too, she knows better. Um, <clears throat> that was my kid, I bet. All right, so it often also happens in the mouth. You'll see them and they're like, oh my God, oh my God. And it like locks up. So now imagine you think something's wrong. 
and suddenly you get numbness and tingling in your hands and they lock together and your mouth starts to lock together and you just start breathing faster and faster and it's a it's a negative feedback loop or is it a positive feedback loop one of those feedback loops not good so it basically tricks you into thinking that you have a serious medical condition um but it's not it fixes itself if you can calm it down slow down your breathing think about what your was going on before that happened usually they can pinpoint some thought or event that caused that triggering or don't think about it at all just don't you know um try and think of something else and see if five minutes later it goes away so this is another one of those kind of you go in and you reassure the patient and you run all the diagnostics to assure that it's not something serious and try and calm them down and if you can calm them down then it's not something serious like if you if you can stop all of those symptoms then it's probably fine it's when you can't that you have to worry about it. So they used to have people blow into a paper bag. Did you ever see that in like movies and stuff? Well, the thinking is they're rebreathing their carbon dioxide. So now they're bringing their carbon dioxide levels up. It's equalizing with the oxygen and they lose the carpal pedal spasms, the numbness and tingling and things go away. We don't do this because there were a lot of, you know, arrogant or lazy medics that thought the patient was in an anxiety attack and it was actually pulmonary embolism. And so it killed them. So we don't go with paper bag treatment anymore. <laughs> it's a bad idea. So anyway, needless to say, we, uh, we treat it all serious. I mean, you can even give the patient, um, you know, they'd say put on a non-rebreather and pop the, the two valves off and run it at a low oxygenation level. It's not so much the high oxygen that's causing it, it's the low carbon dioxide. So it's actually okay to give oxygen to them. It's what you need to do is slow down their breathing. And if, if you put an, an O2 on them and go, all right, you're getting, you know, five, 10 liters, you're, you got plenty of oxygen and you reassure them to the point that they stop breathing that hard, then it clears up. So if a little oxygen helps them get in their head that they're getting treated and it's gonna be fine, that slows their breathing down, the breathing slowed down, stops the carpal pedal spasms and the, and the numbness and tingling, and they kind of self-regulate that way. Okay, remember, three at least on the back, and, or six on the back and four on the front. Okay. One last thing, I'm gonna show you a video. Did it work? So for some reason, it didn't pass along the hyperlinks. Is that something that I should be aware of? Do you computer people understand that? It did work. Anyway, watch this. No, is it massive? Mm, okay. All right. How, how are we feeling right now? Um, any questions about the lecture tonight so far? Yes. Yes. To how it's related to COPD patients. Okay, because patients in a COPD situation like emphysema or chronic bronchitis, they always have high levels of CO2. Got it. That's, how the body is running. That's right. That's how their body runs is always more CO2 in their system. For us, anytime our CO2 creeps up, it triggers those chemoreceptors to say breathe. And so when they first started having issues, like their body is like breathe breathe, breathe. And they'd work for months breathing at a higher level and it's not fixing those receptors. So the receptors get desensitized and they just simply walk around with high levels of CO2 all the time. So it's called like a backup. It's a backup system like is the hypoxic. Concern. That's right. So the hypoxic drive is that, well, that can happen. And if that does, what do we do? Well, they can also breathe due to low oxygen. 
And so most people that have high carbon dioxide levels chronically due to lung issues and disease will then use low oxygen levels, the chemoreceptors that are measuring oxygen when it goes low, <laughs> then they breathe and they gas and they take in air. So the issue only can be if you give them a lot of oxygen, you don't allow that hypoxic drive to trigger. And so they just kind of sit and they're like, no, I got plenty, you know, and carbon dioxide is building up always in their system to toxic levels at this point, because they're not blowing off. It's as much breathing as it is blowing off. Get it a little bit better, a little bit easier. And does that make sense, everybody? Okay, I know, I know everybody, some people are like, nope. Okay, I'm not gonna keep this up. You can look it up on your own. Do you have a question? Okay, Any, anything else? Okay, check this out. <clears throat> Yo, check this out. All right. Um, I cracked myself up. This is the case of an acute pulmonary. You hit that light. And you talk about science being precise. Uh, I now have my doubts. Deep vein thrombosis, irreparable pulmonary thrombolectomy using retrograde pulmonary vein perfusion, irreversible 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 we're looking at the top down from the heart. These are the pulmonary arteries taking blood from the right side to the lungs, okay? You can see the heart, it's beating. What he's gonna do is establish a peripheral circulation so that the heart's getting oxygen, the body's getting oxygen, it's getting blood circulation. Then he's gonna shock the heart and put him into cardiac arrest while he does the surgery. So you, so you can dig this, yeah. So the heart's still getting this. There's a big machine pumping the blood around outside. They just kind of route it around the heart so they can do the operation and the, and the pulmonary artery. And he's placing the right secret pulmonary vein as seen here. This is wide off of the arterial, can arterial cannula and clamp. As you can see, the clamp is in place. We are on full cardiopulmonary bypass support. The next step is to apply the aortic cross clamp and achieve cardiac arrest. Here, we're performing the pulmonary arteriotomy with a knife and then scissors. Does that make sense, a pulmonary arteriotomy? They're going into the pulmonary artery. Yeah, exactly, to get this thing. Okay, good. You can already get a glimpse of the thrombus inside the main pulmonary artery. As it branches, you can see a grasper is used to remove the thrombus. This is a very large cell that originated uh, likely from patients. <laughs> and she had a uh, fracture of her right lower extremity in the cast. Uh, and uh, this is a likely source from the right leg. You can see the embolus is removed. A mm -hmm. Tory catheter is used to um, see, clear look. any further clots, which none are found. Then at this point in time, we take the clamp off of the right super super pulmonary vein cannula. This allows us to perform retrograde pulmonary perfusion. Retrograde pulmonary perfusion. We're going to send blood back up from where it was going to the to the lungs, so that it'll wash back any of the of the clots or anything else that's left in there. Okay. It goes from the pulmonary veins back through the lungs and out the pulmonary artery, as you can see here. Small emboli and air are cleared, you can see in this portion of the video. Once we're satisfied that the pulmonary artery is being cleared with debris, and we ventilate as well during this process, once we're satisfied with that, uh, we'll stop the retrograde pulmonary vein perfusion. We'll inspect with the thoracoscope. You can see how small branches of pulmonary veins. In branching? The main trunk of the pulmonary artery is also clear. And we inspect the thrombus one more time. You can see this is a very well formed thrombus. That is uh -huh. And that ends the case. The patient has done very well following the surgery and uh, anticipate full recovery. I mean, right? So they call that, by the way, it's called a saddle embolus because it sits like a saddle between both, like, is it branches? It just kind of saddles over those two arteries leading. Pretty intense, huh? So watch your leg. You know what I mean? You got the, you stretch your leg out more. Make sure you're not keeping any clots in there. You missed the opportunity to say, well, there's a problem. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, they, I think they do like Doppler electro or um, uh, echocardiograms. They go with a, with like a sonogram and they put it around the areas and it can detect blood coming towards and blood going away from that. It's red and blue shifts. If you know, like how light does that, they've made it also do that. They've colorized the blood coming towards the little wand and going away. And so you can see, it looks like arteries and veins and they can see stops. Another way they can do it is um, they, they um, what is it called? Well, they'll give you some kind of electronic isotope or some kind of dye, and then they'll put you in the cath lab and they can watch as they give the dye, it run through the arteries and go through and they'll detect this one spot, nothing happens. And I'm like, well, it's right there. So they can, it's really, really cool. If you get to the, oh man, it's so great. The ER is like, if they let you into the cath lab and show you some of that footage, it's, it's just like that, it's mind blowing. Like you just see this little heart beating and then suddenly they're like, they're gonna put the dye in and they do it. And all of these blood vessels just darken up. And you see this big web-like pattern. It's so cool, it's so cool. All right, any other questions about tonight? Great, I will see you tomorrow. Have a good night. If you have anything, think of it, just ask me tomorrow.